Hi, thanks for watching my YouTube channel. I'm here today with Joshua Broom. Joshua was in the porn industry as a male performer from 2006 to 2012. He featured in over a thousand movies that grossed over a million dollars. And I'm really excited to have Joshua here to share his story of how he got into the industry, what it was like being in the industry from an insider perspective, and how he got out and what things have been like since then. So hi, Joshua. Thanks so much for coming today. I'm so glad to have you here. Absolutely, Paul. I'm glad, I'm glad to be here. I'm a huge advocate of everything that you're passionate about. And I love, um, I just love seeing at the summit that we, uh, we both took a part of. Um, I, I just love seeing so many um, gifted communicators that, that are passionate about different aspects of, uh, of life and their you know, different educations, different experiences, um, different occupations, but uh, all collectively coming together um, for something that I think is just so important. Yeah, for those that aren't sure what, what Joshua is referring to, it's the National Coalition Against Sexual Exploitation. Uh, they just ran a summit. That's where I, I, Josh and I connected. So go check their website out. Uh, they're doing some great work. Uh, Joshua, I want to start with um, maybe just tell us a bit about yourself uh, in terms of growing up. What was that like, family life? And I, I'm interested in, in things that, formed or shaped you, um, you know, in terms of your temperament, your personality, your experiences, and, you know, that you think are, is important for us to know. So let's start with that. Yeah. I mean, if you're familiar with like Myers-Briggs, like my, my personality types, like ENFJ, like that's who I am. I'm very, I'm very extroverted, very okay. feeling. Um, my J is uh, kind of in the middle. I love scheduling. I love systems. Um, but I'm also like, I'm okay, like how I get there. Um, as far as like uh, who I am as a person, I grew up in a small town in South Carolina and my mom was 16 when she had me. Um, yeah. My father lived in that town, mm -hmm. but he chose not to play the role of father in my life. And that was difficult for me just because, you know, growing up as a kid, I, I saw this person who was my dad but he never played the role of my father. And, you know, I, 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 in, in retrospect, I can, you know, kind of wrap my head around like a 16 year old having the responsibility of being a father and that being overwhelming. Um, but we've reconciled things, you know, since, but growing up as a kid, that was difficult to, you know, to, to comprehend. And it kind of made me feel like what's wrong with me, especially mm -hmm. as I got older, because I saw like him have this family and had other kids and um, they had a very, you know, they, they had the white picket fence and the nice house and they were, they were very well off financially while my mother took great care of me. I never went without anything, but you know, she had, she worked, you know, 50, 60 hours a week in her, in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't have any, like solidified male leadership in my life outside of coaches. You know, I, I played sports growing up. Um, right. but that is, you know, the, all, all the father figures I had in my life truly came from that. I, I, my grandfather was in the home. My uncles were teenagers. So my grandfather was there and you know, he, he loved fishing and he was, you know, loving, but like he, he just, he wasn't someone that like took me under his wing and like taught me, you know, how to be a man. And that was something that I, I never experienced. So I kind of had that longing for like, what's wrong with me? Why doesn't uh, this, this person want to be my father? And um, as far as like strength finder, like I'm in the like 99th percentile when it comes to achiever. So for okay. me, I can, if I tried to supplement my need for affirmation by achieving things, and while that, you know, that momentary achievement fed that need for affirmation, it was momentary. So it's like I, yeah. I would be, you know, I would have, you know, a good game in basketball. I would make the grades. I would make, you know, I would accomplish this, you know, scholastically or I would, you know, score X amount of points. And then I started modeling. 
And when I started modeling when I was 14 or 15, like I really kind of leaned into my identity is that because I had outside sources other than like coaches and family, like affirming me. And I had a lot of success in that. What kind of modeling did you do? uh, I mean, I, I still dabble in it, but I mean, that's why I moved to California. So starting at, you know, 14 or 15, uh, you know, in, into my, you know, early twenties. So about 10 years. Okay. And clothing and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so okay. Run, runway, print, yeah. things like that. Just uh, a question, just a question about the, the, the dynamic with your father. So he's there. I know who he is, but he has nothing to do with me. What, what, what's the, can you sum that feeling up in a, in a word? Like lonely. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, it's like looking through a window at something you can't experience. Yeah, especially when the other family came along and he did choose yeah. to be a part of their life, yeah. right? It was like watching a, you know, a Hallmark movie and not understanding, like, how could I, like, why can't I experience that? Hmm. And so so that, that's what it was like. But it was just, it was very odd because, like, he, he never, like, boldly rejected me. You know, just, he just chose not to play that role in your life. Yeah. As a, as a very, you know, young adult. And then he just lived his life. And like, I, I guess it was just hard for me to comprehend. Like, and then my mom, my mom got married um, when I was a little bit older and that relationship was, was really bad. She was only married for a few years. He was very abusive to her. Um, a lot of drugs in the home, um, never abusive to me or my brother, but, like very abusive to her verbally and physically. And then, you know, there was, he was like abused various substances and just witnessing that. But that was a very short period. So just seeing my mom, like I didn't, I can understand it more now knowing that it happened than like it impacting me then. Um, It impacted my brother in a lot of ways, not Mm. necessarily the the substances, but um, more so, his dad not showing up and not doing things that he said he would. Like I I can remember time after time after time, especially after they divorced that, you know, he was supposed to come, you know, pick my brother up to do, take him to do something and he wouldn't show up. And that's the worst. That's the worst. You're you're better to not plan it at all than to get the hopes up and and then abandon. It's like abandonment really. Right. Right? Now you said he didn't abuse you directly, but what was it? What was it? How, how would you ex- express uh, the effect of watching your mother allow this man into her life and then be mistreated and abused and hurt by her? Did that hurt you? And did you yeah. feel powerless and, and helpless in the face of that? Well, so it was it was strange because it, it never happened in front of us. Like he never oh. touched, he oh. never touched her in front of us. It was always behind closed doors um, in, in their bedroom. Um, and then my mom have, you know, like a, you know, a black eye or a bruise on her arm. And then she, she would, you know, tell me, Oh, I just, you know, did this. And so I, I didn't like, this all is true and it happened, but I, you know, I was eight, nine, 10 years old. So I didn't really comprehend what was going on. I just felt like he was mad all the time. And like me and my brother were just afraid to get in trouble. And and that's kind of how I felt. So I I never felt like fear or I never like saw abuse. Um, I just never experienced or saw a healthy dynamic between a husband and a wife. Because I mean, Mm -hmm. that that was my only snapshot. So nothing Mm -hmm. at all. And then that. So um, that, that achiever mindset and that, you know, need for affirmation mindset, you know, it's it carried over into modeling and, you know, I was very you know promiscuous, like in my relationships, you know, I, I started like hooking up with girls at, at a relatively young age, um, had a hard time being faithful uh, within relationships. I wasn't a good friend um, because it was hard for me to receive love because I couldn't understand it. And it was hard for me to extend trust because I, I felt like, I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't know why I just had such a, a difficult time with that. I think at the end of the day, like I couldn't, I saw something wrong with me. So mm-hmm. it was difficult for me to pro- like truly process someone mm-hmm. caring enough about me. So I couldn't ex- reciprocate that care. 
Well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just list, sorry to interrupt, but I'm just listening to you talk and, and um, you know, I, I always think psychologically being a therapist, you know, and you're talking, there's something called attachment, right? You have secure or anxious or avoidant. And by the time you're a teenager, you formed an attachment style based on how your caregivers treated you. So right. you weren't secure, like what you're just described, promiscuous, not a good friend, you know, because of your experiences with your caregivers where you were probably either avoidant or anxious, you know, I'm not really sure, but, right. but that's, that's just what I'm, I'm thinking when you talk, you know, and the thing yeah. is like, that's not your fault either in a sense, like, yeah, of course we're responsible for our choices, but the fact that that was so hard for you, was not your fault? Because that's your product of your environment in a lot of, right. Ways, right? Yeah. 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 And it was like my, like my mom, you know, tried like so hard to like sure. overcome, for that and um gosh like just looking back like the things that she had to sacrifice and how hard she worked um to provide for us man right. she's like she's an absolute rock star but like having to endure that and do that alone um obviously like really tough but yes i mean i, I continue that path like, into college i yeah, went walk to college. through the, the college and then into the how you got into the industry let's talk about that yeah. So my, my college experience was relatively short, you know, about, okay. about, about two, two and a half years, um, joined a fraternity, two party, went to, went to college with the, you know, so I could play basketball, play basketball a little bit. Um, but really it was all about like girls partying, like community interaction. I really know, like I had no like thought process of, okay, I want to obtain a degree to do this you know i was studying theater just because hey i i, I enjoy modeling and acting this makes sense this is going yeah. to equip me to do what i always i already want to do better and then just after a few years it just made sense for me where i was like you know what um i'm i'm not getting as many opportunities as i would like and the reality is is i'm you know a six two 200 pound brown eye uh you know brown hair, hazel eyed guy that looks like most other people that are doing what I'm doing. And the people that are getting the jobs that I'm not, um, they're in a closer proximity to the job. So I thought, well, it makes sense for me. Just, I'm just going to drop out of school and I'm going to move to Hollywood because if I'm there, it's going to be easy and I'm going to, and I'm going to, you know, have all this, this success. So that's what I did. I, I dropped out of school. Oh, you're still thinking mod, like the modeling world. Is that what you're thinking? Because yeah. this is a this is a mecca for oh, movies yeah. Yeah. and modeling, and that's yeah. where you're gonna hit it big, right? For me, like mod, like not that the modeling industry is easy, but I found success in modeling a lot easier than mm -hmm. acting. Like acting, it it took a lot more work, and like like you know putting together a good reel and auditioning and things like that. Then when it came to modeling, it's like I had a good relationship with photographers. I had an agent that advocated for me uh, very aggressively. I had a good, you know, uh, reputation that showing up on time, doing what needs to be done. So mm -hmm. I found work modeling relatively easy. Acting, on the other hand, it was more difficult. But that was my that was my passion. So like I loved modeling, but like I wanted to act, and like that's really why I wanted to be there. So I move out to L.A., I, I get an agent and things are going OK. But like many people who live in that vicinity, you need a job to, you know, uh, compensate for whatever means that you need to, to live and pay your yeah. rent. And, what. and I started working at uh, like a bar slash restaurant in West Hollywood. Okay. And in that bar is where I met a group of girls and they were like, um, have you ever considered acting? I was like. Yes. And I thought because <laughs> from from my experience, it had been, you know, uh, someone is working on a project and then they introduce you to this person. And in my life, like in, in a lot of times in modeling and in acting, like I've had opportunities because I met someone and they knew someone because it's like it, it when you are a small fish in a big pond, like a uh, relationship is often, you know, the vehicle to get you in the door. So. Yeah like, great, you know, someone like, yeah, I'm actually an actor, you know, this and that and that. And they're like, no, we're talking about porn. I was like. Oh, so they, the girls came right out with porn. Like, oh, yeah. Like, hey. Okay. Like, they didn't try to hide that. Uh, we were porn okay. stars. We all do porn. So they were, they were in porn. Okay. Yeah. 
and they okay. and they asked me, would you be interested in doing it? And I was like, I was I was flabbergasted. You know, I, I didn't know what to say because I had seen porn um, somewhat. You know, I, I, I watched it and I'd seen magazines and stuff like that. But for me, it was this like fictitious thing. Like it, it wasn't real. Like no one does right. this as a job. And right. I think, I think like looking back at how I saw porn is really scary to think about because I saw those people is not real. I saw that action is something that was fictitious. So when, when those, when, when you look at people like that, it's, it's really dangerous to start to paint the picture of a person Mm-hmm. Is anything other than that. But for mm-hmm. me, it was just like, this is crazy because I, I, I never, I, I never thought someone was going to say, Hey, do you want to do porn? I was just like, I, I don't know, but there were four pretty girls. And yeah. I was just like, well, I'd never thought about that. Um, you know, what, what does that entail? What does that look like? They're like, were well, you I think- were you flattered though? Like, wow, these yeah. four good looking yeah. girls are recruiting me. Yeah. Like, wow. Yeah. Right? Because, I mean, my intention was to, you know, to, to, you know, to woo them, you know, to, you know, there were, there were four pretty girls. Uh, so I thought like, you know, maybe I'll get one of their numbers or whatever. Yeah. And um, they said that. So obviously like, yeah, like it was a, it was a pride, you know, it fed my pride, but I was just kind of taken back by it. But, you know, I, I was just kind of like, yeah, sure. You know, whatever. And they're like, well, can we introduce you to our agent? And that really like, I was like, your agent. And for me, my experience, you know, I, like introducing someone to their agent, like that's, that's a big deal. That sounds like professional. Probably like we're Hollywood, like real movies, right? right. Like Brad Pitt right. has an agent, right? Yeah. Yeah. But just mm-hmm. like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll meet with your agent. And right. then, you know, I had this like fake, like plausible reality that I had created that what like the porn industry looked like. So I assumed it would be something that very sketchy, like a weird dude in a hotel, you know, giving me a camcorder and like, you know, go do whatever. But instead I, 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 I meet the guy, but I meet him in this gigantic business complex. That's adjacent to universal studios. Oh, it's this giant building and then there's a private elevator to get up to where his office is. And I walk down this hallway and I open this door and this guy is sitting there at this big desk and he's got a three piece, t- uh, three piece suit on. He's got this double Windsor tie. He's an yeah. English guy, very well spoken, very char- charismatic. And he asked me a few questions and he cut to every single insecurity that I had. You know, I was like, yeah. So I was like, yeah, you know, I'm out, I'm out here trying to, you know, become an actor and I want to be famous and I want to, you know, do this. I want to do that. He's like, great. Um, There's not a lot of good looking guys in porn. And I think that you would do great. And especially because you're doing, you're, you're saying that you have acting experience. The porn industry is actually shifting into this space where there's producing big movies with a script and they need actors. And man, if, if you can do this, you can be a star. And you can make a ton of money. So, so this is a time. So I'm uh, early 2000. So, so this is yeah, like 20, the, the, uh, like, the uh, upswing of the feature film, like not the right. Bonzo porn where it's like a guy and a girl banging in the bed, right. like feature yeah. films with fairly big budgets. Yeah. I, yeah. Huh. You're I'm talking, I mean, stuff like, you know, uh, I, I did a star Wars film where, you know, I played Han Solo and like this film was, a multi-million dollar budget like they right. they rented you know they they rented uh, a studio and constructed something that looked like you know that the falcon you know it's like right it's insane but um this, but this yeah. wasn't endorsed by george lucas though right no 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 that's that's why you, like the, the the caveat for for all those parodies is they would put triple x this or yeah. or da 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 a parody yeah. You had, you had to definitively say that this was not associated with the real thing. But I mean, that, that was where, you know, the, that's where the industry was going. And he was like, yeah, he's like, you can, you can be the guy. And like, he said, you know, he said all the things that I wanted to hear because like that 
I wanted to be famous. But at the same time, like I knew at the end of the day, like, that's not what I want to do. Like, man, I would rather have, you know, uh, I'd rather have six lines in a legitimate movie than do that. Yeah. And that's kind of like where my career was progressing. You know, I was, I was, I was starting to get like speaking roles and stuff like that. I, I was, I was not struggling. And I think, okay. um, I think like that is where my story is somewhat of, a, of an anomaly because. Uh, what's I'm the after, typical story? Because what's it? Well, for, for me, everyone that I, everyone that I talk to, or a lot of people that I talk to, um, it's, um, you know, they experienced a like, you know, s- sexual abuse, or they experienced some type of trafficking, or there was some type of financial need, or right. a reason that they justified doing it. And the only reason that I said yes was because this person told me I could be famous. Okay. Uh, and at the end of the day, like I knew that that was a bad decision. Right. I entertain the idea anyway okay so so did you say yes on the spot or did you be like hey i gotta think I mean, about it and- so i mean something that i historically did is again like i i had commitment issues and i was you know someone who would commit to things and then not follow through mm. so so for me i was just like yeah 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 sounds great man that's awesome okay. um i can't wait to start but leaving thinking there's, I'm not going to do this. This is crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's like, he's like, okay, so the next step in the process is we're going to send a, you know, we're going to send a town car to pick you up. There's standardized testing. Um, everyone gets tested at the same facility that way that, you know, the, everything is consistent and it's, con- it's, con- it's a controlled environment, you know? So, uh, you know, you'll go there, get a full STD and AIDS test, you know, they'll do a urinalysis and a blood work, and then you'll get it back the next day. When that comes back, if everything is good to go, then, you know, we'll, we'll book the scene. And I was like, well, you know, for me, I was like, man, I've, I've been very promiscuous my entire life. At that point I was, you know, 23, 24. I was like, it probably wouldn't be a terrible idea for me to get this test anyway. So I said, and I did that. And everything came back fine. But the thing was, is it didn't come back as early as he thought it would. And everything had to get pushed back a day. And I just remember thinking, like, in my gut, this is a way out, <laughs> right? This is like, yeah, this is my out. Okay. Yeah. I was like, this, like, here is this, you know, this, this instant saying, don't do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, don't do that. Mm. Yet I continue walking into it, essentially walking in like toward disaster Mm. in spite of knowing better. Mm. And it like, honestly, Paul, like I get a set. And again, I have this idea of what it's going to be like, but I get to set and there's it's they've rented out an entire studio. And I walk in and then there's a reception office and then there's catering. And so there's this is like a, like a, the, the feel of a fully professional, legitimate above board business. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. and, that, and that, again, like that is, uh, that's just something that's like slightly different about my story because I never did any work out of those thousand films that that was not of that caliber like that's the right. only company that i worked with but it was all because of that agent that i had because yeah, he was you know the guy in the, right. a- in the biggest agent in the business he owned the biggest agency in the business and the biggest companies booked from him and that's just how it works so i just happened to walk into that situation but who is the uh production company are you, are you able to share that or um you don't have to if you don't want to. I'm yeah. just, it's more I curious. I, I don't remember like it was. It was like a website. I don't remember like what. Um, as far as like what company like that represented me. Yeah. Or um, well, so no, I, like the studio. There was like Vivid and Wicked and like a few other ones like big yeah, studios. I, I, I generally work for Wicked, Vivid. Um, you know all 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 of the the top companies. You know, Digital Playground, like companies like that. You did or didn't? 
I did. Like, I mean, you did. It, okay, okay, yeah. It, so I'm, I'm just trying to place you in the industry, like just from the bit that I know about it. So, okay, I get you. So the high end feature film studios with the bigger budgets. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the only people that I work for. Just because, yeah. I mean, yeah. But so so what so just so what what's your thought process as you're because you know I, I I sense this back and forth sort of you know the angel and demon talking on your shoulder for days and weeks but right. you're driving there for your first day of shooting what's your thought process as you as you go there yeah I mean like, like, you're just thinking about the money or what yeah I mean for me it was just I don't know it was like the end goal wasn't to make money like oh. I wasn't like hurting financially like what was, I, the end goal? What was the goal I mean, the goal is to be, to be famous. famous. I mean, that's the goal, you know? Okay. So, and so I walk on the set again, like there's a receptionist. I walk in, there's catering, you know, here's the catering over there, you know, help yourself with whatever you want. Um, I, and I, and I continue on the set and then there's like an entire production set up, you know, there's Kino flows like in uh, almost like a stadium lighting around this day bed. And there's this girl in this bed and they're taking photographs of her. But but there's a camera A, there's a camera B. Um, there's someone walking around like shooting BTS. You know, there's boom mics and, you know, there's, you know, there, there's a grip. You know, there's there's like it's a movie set. Mm -hmm. And that like it was weird that like that almost like gave me a strange level of comfort, like. It was intimidating, but it was like, okay, this is legit. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not some weird guy with a camcorder yeah. in a dark room and a, a yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's what I thought it was gonna be. And I was like, mm -hmm. if it's that, I'm bouncing. I'm out of here. Yeah. Um, but it's that, and then and this and, you know, production assistant comes up to me, he's like, Hey, um, we're gonna need you. And so this is after I, you know, I, I filled out some paperwork that I didn't really look at. I just signed my name and just whatever, you know, sign my name wrote down my social security number and, you know, he, you know, here's whatever, like not, didn't read a word. And uh, he says, okay, so here's a Viagra. If you've never taken one, I would bite it in half. I wouldn't use the whole thing. Um, there's, there's bottled water over there. Um, there's restrooms over here. We're going to need you in 15 minutes. I was like, so do you know, so do you know what you're supposed to do? No. No clue. No clue. I, you, here's a Viagra. We need you in 15 minutes. Obviously, it's the bed with the girl, but that's it. You don't know the what you're shooting? No, no clue. And and there was never any interaction with the girl. So, you know, hi, I'm Joshua or whatever you're – did you use a fake name at that point or – Yeah. Okay, yeah. so hi, I'm whatever fake name and it wasn't yeah. even that. No. Oh, okay. Okay. So what, what happens next? What are you so, thinking? Are you kind of just like, okay, it's too late to go back now? Yeah. Like that's, that's kind of like how I approach it. It's like, I'm here. Uh -huh. It's almost like I walked over a line where there's no going back and kind of how I felt. It's like, I'm already here. There, there, there's our, like, I've already filled out paperwork. Like, what am I going to do? Am I just going to leave? Like, uh, yeah. what am I going to do? You know? And so I, I go to the bathroom and I like give myself this pep talk. It's like, do you want to do this? Are you sure? Don't do this. I think I'm going to do it anyway. Don't, don't do this. All right, and, right. and then I'm thinking like, okay, he told me to take half of it. I've never taken this before. What is this going to do to me? Yeah. I was like, I, and I took the whole thing. I took the whole thing. And then, you know, I, and I, and I walked onto set and they're like, okay, we're, we'll need you in uh, two minutes. And they're like, you know, they, they explain the scenario or whatever and gave me you know, this piece of paper that had, uh, you know, a few lines of a script. And I, I walk in and I, I say my lines and then it happens. And like for me, it's like it's crazy because I don't remember one second. As soon as I, as soon as the like the director like waved me into frame, like I don't right. remember a second of what happened. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm driving home. I have a check on my hand and, you know, and, and I, I'd showered, but I still kind of had like, you know, like lubricant, like on my thigh that I couldn't really get off. And I just felt like dirty and just felt like 
gosh, that was just such a stupid thing to do. I just, what I was thinking about, I just felt like I almost had my gut this like feeling of like I had bad news to tell someone, but you know, it's like, it's like dread, this dread of like, I did this thing and I'm going to have to face up to it. Wow. It was, was like, do you recall it, the sex even being enjoyable or pleasurable or? I mean, so I mean, the, the thing is, like, when you're when you're doing those scenes, it's like you know, a, literally a director is like, OK, so we need five minutes of this position, five minutes of this position, five minutes of this position, five minutes of this position. OK, we need you to finish in the next five minutes. Yeah. OK, now I'm going to give you a signal when you I need you to move. I need you to open right. up the camera. I yeah. need you. You know, there's a guy there's a guy with a sea light like moving around you like as you move. So like for me, it was like th the actual action, like I, I like it, it always was like that. It was just a task. Yeah. It was like trying to, to perform this task in a way that paints a picture for the camera. Because right. like for me, it's like I, I just wanted to do a good job. So doing a good job, like the sex was irrelevant because that you like you weren't getting paid to like have sex with her well or or please her in any way or or please yourself like that's not mm -hmm. what the objective is the objective is to paint a picture that looks good for the camera so like opening right. up How about the having, shot the angle right. the yes. whatever have, right. advantageous like angle and doing this and doing mm -hmm. that and just you know and that for me like that that is what drove me it's like okay do do this do that do that whatever and you know and then it was over and I don't know. Just like that. That's like my personality type. It's like whatever I'm doing, I just want to be the best at it. I don't care if it's, you know, that or, yeah. you know, like cutting the grass, like at my house, like whatever it is, I just want to do it to the absolute best of my ability because that's just who I am for good or for bad. You know, like when it comes to partying, um, I'm either not drinking at all or I'm getting hammered, you know, like that, like that's oh, why wow. yeah. that point. Um, so like I had like a very like, I don't know, just like my personality type. It, it was just kind of kind of crazy how that played out in that way. Did you but, did you make eye contact with the girl at any point? Talk to her, exchange words, talk after. Like, like it, it sounds very impersonal. Oh, incredibly I, I mean, like you literally like you finish and then you get out of the way because they take more photographs of her. So like you like I'm literally gone and they're right. there's pictures of her. There was like there, there, there was not one word or genu any genuine interaction whatsoever. Like nothing that would resemble yeah. like normal human interaction. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, and, and that's, I don't know. It, it was just strange. Like, like, again, like I don't remember a ton of that, but I just remember like feeling like afterwards. And then it's like, I was kind of hanging out with a girl at, at the time. So I had to tell her, I'm like, Hey, I did this thing. Well, yeah. What'd you do today? I oh, shot a porn movie. Yeah. And she like lost her mind. She was like, sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm very hurt. But the thing was, is she also worked at that restaurant slash bar that I worked at. And we, and, and she was a very successful dancer. So she, um, she came from, you know, like uh, she, she was on a dance team in college and then she was in like, she was in several music videos. Like she was really like climbing like to success in, in the world of dance, um, like doing really well for herself and very respected. And I hurt this person that all of my friends were her friends and they have been her friends longer. So all of a sudden I was like, gosh, I just really you know, burned that bridge. And then I was like, I can't go back to that job. So I quit that job. And then the agent calls me. He's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, um, from my understanding, you know, the director said everything went great. Um, I want to sign you to a contract. Oh, um, so this was just kind of a trial run for you at this point, yeah, maybe, right? Yeah. Let's yeah, because see I mean, what happens. Yeah, because, I mean, the thing is, so, at, like, guys getting into the industry is incredibly difficult because a director takes on all the risk. A oh, director right. is taking on, you know, he's paying for the talent. He's paying for the crew. He's uh, renting the space. He's uh, paying for any kind of um, 
you know, what, whatever uh, you need to obtain to be able to film um, mm-hmm. the catering, you know, the, yeah. the production crew, the equipment, all these things, the director is footing that bill. And at the end of the day, if the guy doesn't do his job, there's no product. So the guy is the only person that's not guaranteed to get paid. No matter what, everyone else gets paid because they did their job. So, so, so how do you not get paid then? Like by not, not showing up or what do you mean? No, no, no. If, if you, if as a, as a guy, yeah. if you cannot perform the task as needed. So, right? so in other words, maintain an erection for two hours. Right. Or, fin- yeah. or and then finish. So like, you know, right. maintain action for the entirety of the film and then yeah. finish in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so if you, if you don't do that, then there's, there's no product. Because right. you're trying to create a product, and if you can't provide a product at the mm-hmm. end of the day, the director has just wasted this money. So I say that to say, if if you if a director trusts you, you know, the, because the guys are to some degree irrelevant in 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 the in porn. Yeah, you're kind so, of a prop, right? You're right. kind of a yeah, prop, absolutely. and the focus is on the woman, right? Yeah. Unless it's gay porn. Absolutely, and then yeah. so it's like you so. Ultimately, like if a director trusts you, he's going to hire you pretty much every time he does a movie. Right. And, that, and that's just kind of like how I made my career. I had, you know, five or six companies that happened to be the top companies in the, in the business. I had a good relationship with the director and they trusted me. So I worked 25 to 30 times a month or sometimes more. And so as I, I, I kind of felt like, well, I already did this thing. There's nothing else I can do um, within days that, that that film came out it was on the internet and you know my link my name was linked to it and then i got a phone call from my agent my you know my my acting agent my modeling agent um it's like we're gonna have to you know you this breaches the contract of you know you carrying yourself you know in in this regard and we're gonna have to you know oh the, oh the modeling agency that you so yeah. you signed with a modeling agency and within days of you making that film, they cut ties with you. Yeah. And you lost your not well, girl, girl you were seeing or whatever. She broke it off with you. Yeah. And then I, and then I quit and I quit that, you know, and you job. Quit your job. Yeah. So, so it's like, interesting how it's interesting how like you, you cross that line and within a week, the, the, yeah. the, the connections to the rest of the world are sort of like yeah. being severed. And yeah, then, like, did yeah. that get you thinking like, well, crap, I might as well just go all in now. Like, this is all that's, I got. That's exactly what I thought. I mean, I, I was like, well, this is my bed. I I have no choice but to lie in it. You know, right. like I, I have been building this career, you know, since I was, you know, a, a 14 year old. And then all right. of a sudden, everything that I worked for was gone. And wow. all like. And I was like, I was living, you know, in, in West Hollywood. And, and it's like, man, I had rent and I had stuff. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but this is the only opportunity I have. So I might as well do it. So I, I go in and just thinking, you know, yeah, I'm going to sign the contract. And then, you know, like, I don't know how it's going to go. You know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but I went from, I did that one movie and this was in, Uh, It was, it was right. It was in the late, the later part of the summer in uh, 2000, mm, like 2006 in the the later part of the summer, 2006. And from that time until December, I did two, I did 200 movies. Oh my gosh. And I, I was, I was not only working every day, I was working multiple times a day. And I, and, and it was like, it was like, I went from this, you know, that this guy that was doing whatever and all, like within three months, there was like clubs in Las Vegas, like paying me to get a table there. They were flying me into Vegas and a nightclub was, you know, saying that I was going to be there because I was this person of, of some notoriety. And that was just kind of how like the next five years went like that. So like, you, you, d- you achieve a degree very quickly, a degree of notoriety as right. a adult film star yeah and it and it had a right. lot to, it had a lot to do with those like the films that we're talking about like the parodies like you know they we did a, a parody of entourage and i played the lead and, and they you know okay. did star wars and i played Riker, and we did mm-hmm. 
I, I was Aquaman and I was Han Solo and I was, yeah. you know, I like anything they did. Like I was, if not like the lead, I was like, you know, one of the leads. I, and that was just kind of um, what made me have the notoriety that I did and the quantity of my work. So, and then, you know, in, in a five year span, you know, I, you know, I did a thousand films and that's with, you know, porn's not shot really in December and January because, you know, in the year, everyone's trying to wrap up, you know, from like, even though it's porn, it is still, it still is a business. So like you have an allotment of money that you want to spend in that year and you're trying to, you know, utilize those funds and you're trying to get that, you know, get products in because AVN, so at the adult, you know, video video network. Yeah. Like that, that there's the AVN show and then there's um, X biz and those are the two like big, um, like shows and you're trying to get everything in because like if you, if you have like a certain date to turn those movies in by and if you turn those movies in by that it's like then they're they can be up for awards and you know at that point you know that, that award show was broadcasted live on showtime you know it, it was oh. a it, it was a big deal right so and you won, just, you won a performer of the year one time right yeah I, I, I won several awards. I was nominated for performer of the year three times and I won it the last year I was in the business in 2012. And who nominates these, who nominates people? So, I mean, it's like a lot of factors, like how, like how well the movies do. And then there's, um, I mean, pretty much like anything else works. So like there's, there's people who work for, you know, that company and then they have a, a board of people that, you know, that nominates things and okay. I, you know there's there's companies I, i'm sure like to some degree there's companies that invest a lot into certain people and they want to advocate for them they want to advocate for those films and really it's just the objective is like the award's not a big deal but the notoriety and the yeah. momentum that comes with the award sells more movies and 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 for an actor or an actress it makes you know your worth higher you know because like mm. you are an you're an individual contractor and you know you you ask like hey this is how much i charge per movie you know and you're in you most people most people that work with consistency have have an agent so their eight your agent is negotiating those those things with companies and you know just like if you win that you can charge more and, and so on so okay. yeah so i was nominated for it three times and won it once and won a few other awards and stuff mm. like that so what what kind of money are we talking about for, for a guy that makes a movie a day kind yeah of, you know yeah, are, so are you making six you must be making six figures then at this point right oh yeah oh yeah so i mean i i was making you know between i started out like when the first like few years I, it was like between like 175 to 200 and then like the last few years i was in the industry it was like two between 250 and 275 wow yeah, because I mean, I was, I mean, I was making you know eight hundred to a thousand dollars a film, working twenty to thirty times a month. And and how long? But the time uh, driving there, doing the show, cleaning up, coming home. Is it three four hours work? Are, are you uh, there all day? Uh, if you said you'd even do two more, days sometimes. Yeah, so it just depends on the company. So and it depends on what like what your role is in the. You know, if it's something, you know, it could be something that would um, be a like a high profile company that produces some gonzo ish content mm -hmm. like in that way. Like you might be looking at a three, four hour day. But usually if you're working on a movie like it would be, you know, a, a 10 to 12 hour day because, you know, there's like there's five sex scenes in a 90 minute movie. But right. you know, there's higher movie to be shot so i mean like star wars for example like it that was shot over like a three and a half week you know stint right and you're not there every day though for three and a half weeks you're just there on when you're seeing uh, yeah i mean for, for me just because of the character i was playing i was there pretty much every day but like you would yeah, get there right. you know hair and makeup and you know for me like i had a had a, had a wig or whatever um and like you know Kind of the same deal where it's like, you know, you, you would be there and um, I would make X amount of like it, the funny thing was like, you would make X amount of dollars 
if you were having sex, but then you had a um, it, like a non-sex role play, or a non-sex day rate. Oh, okay. So you would like over the over that time period, I would get paid an allotted amount, um, but like each day would be different. So if like if I was having a sex scene, I would get paid X amount of dollars. If I wasn't, instead of getting a thousand dollars, I was getting five hundred dollars for just being on set and just doing mm-hmm. dial whatever. So I, I, okay, so as you're, you know, you got in pretty deep, pretty quick. It sounds right. Right. What What are you? Um, oh, I got a lot of so many questions. So I guess I'm thinking, t- t- tell us about the the women in the industry and maybe some of the other male performers. Things you noticed, things you saw. What What was um, What was it like for them? Yeah, I mean, it was strange because like there there were definitely like women that like kind of came and went, like especially like younger, like. 18 19 20 year olds they would you know they'd be in the industry for a few months and then they would disappear and like there there weren't a like there's not a lot of like you know if you go like way back like jenna jameson there's there were no like porn stars like there were there would be girls who would be really popular for a short period of time you know maybe a year or so that you know they would sign a contract with a company and that company would really advocate for them um but there were girls who were like popular, but there were no like stars. So I say that to say like girls kind of came and went. Um, yeah. Um. Some were like very disturbed and strung out, and um, you know, kind of felt like you know, I don't know if like this person wants to be here, or they're kind of like spaced out, or then it was so so like every day was a circus. You know, like every like I wouldn't I wasn't surprised whatever I saw. I, but like for me, it was like I was so numb to it, I didn't care. Like I was there, I was there to do my job. I was gonna do what I needed to do, like whatever. Yeah, you know, I was always like, I, I was always like kind and professional. And you know, for my time in the industry, I, I dated a few girls for a long period of like a long like for for that industry, like a long period of time. You know, a few months here and there, or like almost a year. And now they were in the industry too. You mean? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. I, so. And like, that was probably one of the most um, mentally damaging things for me because being in a monogamous relationship with someone who has sex for a living and so do you, you can't do it. Right. And, but it's like, but, but the thing is, is you genuinely are saying that we are in a monogamous relationship. So you compartmentalize your work right. as something that's separate over there. And the, but here's here's the deeper, darker part of this. So all the all the guys in the industry. So I mean, there's there's a, a probably a group as small as twenty guys, twenty five guys that work on a consistent basis. Okay. You sit that for hours and hours at a time. We know each other very well. Like all the okay. top guys, we 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 always work for the same companies. We spent hours and hours and hours and hours sitting there, you know, shooting the breeze. So right. these people become at, at minimum, you know, a, an associate of yours, you know, a, a somewhat of a yeah, friend. Acquaintance, yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden these people who you have a relationship with to some degree and you've known for a long time, you start dating this person and your, your friends are now working with this person. So Talking imagine sex with your girlfriend, basically. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're going to dinner and like you're trying to create this reality where you're going to the dinner with your girlfriend and then and then this other person and their girlfriend and you've had sex with their girlfriend the last week. They've had sex with your girlfriend, maybe today. And we're sitting there hanging out, holding hands, pretending like we're in this lovey-dovey relationship and it was just so like for me like growing up like I felt like I needed to protect my mom you know yeah, like yeah so like had like a very like jealous person so okay. like mindset and just and and trying to like process that was so difficult and just I mean there's just something like so healthy so unhealthy about suppressing like deep hurt like that right and 
And there was a, there were a relationship that I was in for a longer period of time. And, you know, we, we even talked about like, you know, maybe, you know, getting married one day or something. And, um, she actually enjoyed talking about it. Like it, she wanted to incorporate that as part of our relationship. And for me, like I, I said, you know, sure. You know, and, and I, but, but because before that I would be like, don't talk about it, whatever it is, what it is. I don't want to talk about it, but she wanted to talk about it because she enjoyed talking about it. And man, when I allowed that into our relationship, like that, like that was, that was, you know, the beginning of the end for me, because that led to a very, like that relationship did not last very much longer. And that, that was the thing that like really led me into like a very deep, dark depression because I just kind of felt an even uh, heavier layer of that shame and that guilt because that's something I carried with all the time. When I, when I let, when I lay down at the end of the day, I knew what I was doing. I wasn't proud of it. I mean, the, the proxy of me being in that industry allowed me to be very financially wealthy. Um, people knew who I was when I walked down the street. Um, people paid me to go places. I signed autographs. Everything was hunky dory on the, you know, the aesthetically, but yeah. on the inside, I was humiliated because people were coming in, you know, like guys would ask for my autograph and it would be like so weird. It's like, you watch me in that. And I know what you do when you watch that and you want my autograph. Like it's just yeah. so bizarre. Did any, like, of that, did any of that make you happy or fulfill the money, the notoriety, the fame? I mean, I mean the, mo the money and the no notoriety, um, like I, like what I really like hung on was like when we would do really big movies and I would like get accolades for the acting or like, you know, I'm on the box cover and, you know, it's like mm. we're, I'm working with the director to like, I, I ended up, so I, I did a year contract with Penthouse where I directed movies. So just like, you know, writing a script and, you know, um, casting it and like watching oh, okay. it, you know, you know, seeing, you know, whatever, like on camera, like unfold, like not sex, but just like, you know, the story that I, that I wrote, like mm. you know, fruition. But like in, it, even at the like at the end of the day, it was just like man, like I wanted it so badly to be something else, and that's why like I I had a lot of opportunities to do uh, movies for Showtime, movies for Cinemax, and they would be you know pretty much like soft car soft core porn. You know, it, it would be something with a very like mediocre at best storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, like pretty bad acting, pretty bad script, yeah. but, but the sex wasn't real. It was, it, the, the sex was fictitious and, you know, generally like it was shot in like cool places. Like I, I did a movie in, you know, Bucharest, Romania and got saw like, you know, all these castles and stuff. And I was in, you know, Costa Rica doing this film, like where we were on this beach and we were in like, um, like these tree houses, like overlooking this uh, peninsula called whale's tail in Costa Rica. Yeah one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. So mm -hmm. I had all these opportunities to do stuff. So I would just cling to like anything that like resembled. I just wanted to be an actor. I wanted to create things. I'm, I'm very creative. I'm and that's how like, I like, I just love it. I love right. it. I love writing. I love communicating. I love crafting things. Like I just love it. And I so badly wanted to be something that I could be proud of, but I never could. So you're doing some of the things you wanted to, but not in, not in a way that you could could be yeah, proud like, of. It didn't yeah. feel legit, I guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's like mm. um, it's like you can do this as long as you're willing to compromise yourself to this degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you if you tell yourself the lie that this is okay or this is something that it's not, then all of a sudden, if you tell yourself a lie long enough, it becomes mm. true you to you. It. Yes. So that's, that's how I lived. But all of a sudden, like that relationship, it just led to like a really dark place. And I was already um, I remember I went to my brother's graduation. So my brother is uh, a Ph.D. He's a he's a professor at a university in South Carolina. He's a, genet a genetics professor. And I remember going to one of his like 15 graduations and 
someone recognized me and like, I, I was just there to support and celebrate my little brother. And like, I just remembered feeling like really ashamed Wow. because like, I was there like to be his big brother and right. I was very proud of him um, and just felt like really ashamed. And that experience combined with what I was enduring in, the, in that, what I allowed into that relationship um, it was just, a, it was just this downward hill, like train that was going a million miles an hour. And I stopped answering. I stopped, I stopped answering um, the phone. I stopped. Um, so I stopped reaching. My withdrew, mom's. Still, you I, really withdrew and isolated yourself. Oh yeah. You got more I, I, I isolated myself from everyone. I isolated myself from everyone to do to the extent where I did not like a year before I quit, I did not hear my real name from one person for over a year. Wow. It sounds like the more sex you had, the less intimacy you experienced. Oh yeah. I mean, and you had like, to pretend all the time, like, like you're pretending that you want to be there. You're pretending you enjoy it. Right. You're pretending that it's fun. You're pretending this is my girlfriend and we're in a normal relationship, but of course it's not like that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. all of it's like, you're trying to tell yourself that it's something that's not. Yeah. And you're, and you're just clinging to anything that even remotely feels like it's real. I mean, I, I say it jokingly, but you know, it's kind of like that, the movie Tropic Thunder was like, I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. Right. That's what it was every day. I was someone, wow who was playing the role of this fictitious adult actor that I had created and cultivated that everyone knew um, that like, that wasn't a hundred percent authentic, you know, myself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then on top of that, you know, you're, you're, you're playing in all these films. So you, you know, there, there's another layer of, you know, acting and at no point was I ever myself. Mm -hmm. And I began to just absolutely lose any touch of reality like when i say looking like the most uncomfortable thing in the world to me back then was looking someone in the eye and shaking their hand was so creepy to me because that that felt so real like that that was far more uncomfortable for me than having sex with someone wow wow so you, you you dissociated a lot of the time during the sexual acts and shut your feel. Did, did you, did you make a choice to shut your feelings down or was it just something you I think, needed to do? Did it just happen? Like how, what, what happened? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I just lived in a way where I felt shame and guilt all the time. And right. the, natural, the, the, the proxy of that was me isolating myself and um, losing any like aspect of, of who I actually was. So one thing I've noticed, cause you know, I, I've studied this, this, the industry a little bit and uh, try to keep up on things. And I've been shocked at how dark and violent and abusive and degrading porn has become, especially in the last 10 years. And I know you got out about nine years ago. Yeah. I'm curious what you saw in the industry in terms of violence and abuse to women and did, did they, were they really just treated as commodities that were disposable? Was anything done to protect them? Like what kind of stuff did you see? Yeah. Um, so in, in the industry, when you get in the industry, there's something that you have, you have a conversation with your agent and you lay, lay out these boundaries, which um, in the industry that the lingo would be no list, right? Mm -hmm. No, list. Mm -hmm. um, you are, uh, you are not willing to do these things, mm. you know, like some people like I don't want to do like BDSM. I don't want this. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. And then also, like, I don't want to work with, you know, these people. Oh, OK. That that happens sometimes more often than not. If that happens, either a someone is 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 too rough or abusive or whatever. And they they don't want to work with them because of that. Or what also happens is as you, you know, you are in a relationship and then that relationship ends badly. And then you just, I mean, you can fake it, but not, you know, it, that's sometimes that's too difficult to do. Um, or just being on set with him is just not a good thing. But so I say that to say, so 
when you get in the industry, this specifically goes for women. Um, this doesn't really happen for guys, but you know, for women, it's like, Hey, you're my agent. I trust you. Here's the things that I don't want to do. All those things that they don't want to do is very taboo. And there is a subcategory for them. So the agency actually holds on to them and then auctions them off to companies. And then the company will say, well, I know that you said that you didn't want to do this. Well, the company will say to the agent, okay, we'll give them X amount of dollars if they do this. And then the agents, the agent says, well, you know, your career has been dissipating slightly. And uh, if, if you wanted to, you know, make yourself more relevant again, I know you said that you didn't want to do that, but if you consider doing it, um, this company is willing to pay you X amount of dollars. So ultimately right. agents auction off things that you say no to. Okay. Over- and then you uh, find women. So the boundaries get pushed and then the women end up agreeing to things they initially did not want to do. Correct. Okay. Correct. So like, did, did I see like, I mean, again, I, I worked for companies that like, they did not want to produce content like that. Um, but I did have conversations with, you know, several girls that have been on sets that they have to get makeup to cover up bruises because they work, you know, with this company that asked them to do this stuff and it, and it got too rough and then they have bruises or um, I'm, you know, hearing, I'm never going to work for that company again. They asked me to do this. I told them I didn't want to do this. And then this happened anyway. And another level of abuse that happens is a lot of directors who would, if they would shoot camera, um, not a lot of directors do, uh, actually probably half and half, you know, they, either you would hire someone to operate the camera for you and some directors had experience and they would operate like camera one. Um, and they would ask girls prior to like, Hey, do you want to, um, if you'd be interested um, after the scene, um, you know, we could, we can do an additional POV and I would give you 500 extra dollars. So meaning that um, you're going to go to the back and give that person oral sex and I'm going to give you five, 500 extra bucks. But okay. uh, often uh, from the girl's perspective, they would say, you know, they felt like if they didn't do that, that mm-hmm. director wasn't going to hire them again. Right. <laughs> Okay, I know we're running out of time. Can you just uh, walk us through what led you to leaving the industry and what's happened since then? Yeah. Um, so, so really quickly. Yeah. Um, so at, at the end of my career, um, I was depressed to the point where when I did win that award, um, when I won that performer of the year, uh, you know, they're on stage, they're calling my name, they're calling my name, they're calling my name, and I'm not there. And my PR person is calling me. My agent is calling me. I'm not picking up. And I'm actually on my face in my home, crying my eyes out, calling out to the God that I really didn't know at the time, asking him if I could die because I saw what my life was. I didn't see a future. And I thought that, well, you've ruined your life. I can't keep doing this because the weight that it has on me mentally and emotionally. And I wow. just saw you know, the, the fact that, you know, I, I messed up this relationship with my mom. I wasn't there for when she needed me. Um, my, my big, you know, I wasn't a big brother to my little brother when he needed me. Um, and all these things, it was just like weighing on me. And I walk into a bank and, um, often I would just put it in the ATM or just deposit it, um, through like, uh, you know, the, the Dropbox or whatever. And I, had to have an interaction with a teller and I had the interaction, you know, gave them the check, deposited it. I was leaving. And as I was leaving, she said, Joshua, is there anything I can do to help you? And man, when she said my name, it absolutely crushed me because it had been, it had been a year since I heard my real name. Wow. And just like, I go home and I'm looking myself in the mirror and I'm seeing this person that I don't know. And I just lose it. And I feel the weight of everything I'd done. And like, honestly, like I had this like huge mental breakdown. And then when I pulled myself together, I picked up the phone and I quit. And, and that was it. Just like that. You made a phone call and set them out. Yeah. I mean, I, I called my agent. 
I quit. I called the company that was I was in a contract with. Yeah. I understand that there's going to be a financial responsibility for me to, you know, compensate you for whatever, you know, whatever agreement that I've broken. Um, send me an invoice. And then I called my PR person and told them to do a press release that I had retired or quit. Wow. And Thank you very much for sharing. Goodbye for now. And let, let's stay in touch and maybe we can do a quick, you know, just sort of a, yeah. a little more of a yeah, yeah, summary. It, there's, and what have like, you done since then? Cause I'm, I'm curious of where, where you've gone with your life in the last nine years. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like lo lo long story, really short. Um, so I left the industry I ran from any responsibility from being in the industry for two years. I started working at a gym and um, people kept finding out. I, I lied to everyone I met about who I was, where I'd been, everything. And they would, you know, it would, it would pop up. You know, I, I, I at that time, because of the way the industry works is like, you do all this stuff and then it slowly funnels out. So like mm -hmm. I was, you know, one of the, if not the most, one of the, most popular guys in that industry and wow. it was everywhere yeah. and i i still like tried to run from it and i tried my best just to lie to everyone i met and after about two years of that of just getting found out and hurting people and just um you know just continue to chip away like working at that gym and i started to have a little bit a little bit of success at the gym and then i ended up you know with the opportunity to be in a managerial position at the gym and then I met this girl and I was like, man, um, she's awesome. I asked her if we could go out um, for, on a date. She said no. <laughs> and then she, she said, um, well, actually, the, w when I first talked to her, I tried to put her equipment away at the gym. She told me I can put my own stuff away. I was like, wow. You know, <laughs> okay. All right. yeah. then I asked her if we could go on a date and she said no. She said, we could go for a run. I was like, okay, I'll take what I can get. And we, and we meet to go for a run. And I was like, man, this girl's awesome. I, I can't lie to her because everyone outside any relationship I had tried to be in, I didn't tell them and they found out and they broke up with me, you know, right, like, right. or like, regardless of whatever the relationship was, I mm -hmm. lied, but I got found out. Mm -hmm. So for her, I was like, man, I just have to, I just have to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I, he just said, Hey, I got to tell you something. And I told her everything. And at the, at the end of me talking for a long time, she's, a, she's a processor. Um, so she paused and then she said, well, the person that I see standing in front of me, isn't, you know, a, a collection of things that you did. The person I see in front of me, you know, cares about people. Um, from what I know, like you have good work ethic, you're a good coach, you care about people, you're, you're educated and, you know, the, you know, in the realms of fitness and health. Yeah. And all of a sudden I, I saw myself as someone that was not other than the porn star. And um, she asked me if I knew God and I was like, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I believe that God exists. I believe that, you know, time, space, and matter came into existence at the same time. And I think there had to be something existing outside of those things for all three of those things to come into existence at the same time. So that, that makes sense to me. So yeah, I believe that God created everything. There was a catalyst for me, you, and everything we see. She's like, great. Well, do you know God? Like, are you, are you in a relationship with God? And I was like, I don't know. I've never, I've never really never like, thought about it. Yeah. And, um, that conversation led to us going to church together. And then I heard about Jesus and I responded to that message and I gave my life to Christ in that moment. So, right. so in, and so in that person who I exchanged that moment with is now my wife, we've been married for five years. We have wow. three kids. Um, I, I went back to school, um, studied uh, religion with a focus on Christian ministries, and I'm pursuing my master's now. And I've been in ministry for five years. I've been a pastor for two, and I've launched a nonprofit organization that my wife and I run. So amazing! A lot okay. is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank. I know. I know we're out of time. I want to thank you again for for uh, sharing your story, uh, being so uh, vulnerable and uh, and real. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to maybe one day we'll chat again, do a part two oh, and uh, keep up. Yeah, that, was, work. 
that was that was too that was too abrupt of an ending. We 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 built. Yeah. So it's like we can't just be like, and then then the movie ended. You know, it's like we can't we can't do that. But yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, okay. Well, I'll I'll wish you a great rest of the day and a good weekend, Josh. And so good to connect. And uh, we'll talk again. All right, brother. Sounds great.